Question 7. In line 63, her birthright is best interpreted to mean Louisa's what? Let's read over that line in the surrounding context. That afternoon, she sat with her needlework at the window and felt fairly steeped in peace. Lily Dyer, tall and erect and blooming, went past, but she felt no qualm. If Louisa Ellis had sold her birthright, she did not know it. The taste of the pottage was so delicious and had been her sole satisfaction for so long. Serenity and placid narrowness had become to her as the birthright itself. You can refer to the footnotes to get the context of this allusion to pottage and the birthright, and it is important to understand it. This refers to the account in the Bible, in the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, where there are these twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. And Esau, being the oldest twin, has the birthright, which means that he is the heir to all the privileges and inheritance that come with being the firstborn. One day, Esau has been out hunting for a long time, and he comes home tired and hungry, and Jacob has made some pottage, which is like a red soup or stew. Esau is so hungry that he trades his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of this pottage, which, of course, is a really bad deal for him. So this question is alluding to this biblical account, and we're trying to figure out what the birthright is that Louisa has sold or traded in exchange for pottage which represents something less valuable, or at least less valuable in some people's eyes. Our first choice is A, special relationship with Lily Dyer. There's no indication of any kind of potential relationship that Louisa might have wanted to have with Lily Dyer, and no reason to think that having a relationship with Lily Dyer could be considered a birthright for Louisa. This is a very unsatisfactory answer. B, inherited property. While inherited property might qualify as a birthright, there's nothing in here to indicate that Louisa has inherited property, so this answer can't be supported from the passage. C. Chance for marriage. A chance to get married can be considered a birthright for a woman, for anyone really. You can say that as humans we have the right to get married, and certainly Louisa has a right to have a chance to get married. She has given that up in this passage. She's broken off her relationship with Joe in favor of a life alone. The solitary life that she is looking forward to would certainly be compared to pottage by many people. A solitary life doing household chores might seem to others as practically worthless next to the potential joys of a married life, but Louisa thinks of it as delicious and as her sole satisfaction. Since we see that doing household work is as natural to her as breathing and that she finds satisfaction from doing it, she's looking forward to doing it as long as she lists or wants to, then this solitary life, keeping her house and doing as she pleases, matches the description in the passage as her sole satisfaction for so long. So then, this solitary life is the pottage that Louisa accepted in exchange for line 63's birthright. She considers serenity and placid narrowness to be the real birthright in lines 65 and 66. There's very strong support for this, so C, chance for marriage, is a great answer. D, inherited position as a respected member of the community. There's nothing in here to support either that Louisa has had a place as or might have given up a place as a respected member of the community. There isn't anything about this at all, in fact, so this answer isn't supported. E. Natural inclination toward a peaceful life. Since the birthright in line 63 is the thing that might have been given up, and a natural inclination towards a peaceful life remains with Louisa, as serenity and placid narrowness has become her birthright over the birthright that she might have lost in line 63, this answer is insupportable. And the best response is C, chance for marriage. Question 8. The chief effect of the imagery and figures of speech in lines 65 through 75 is to what? And let's take a look at the imagery in 65 to 75. This part of the passage reads, 
Serenity and placid narrowness had become to her as the birthright itself. She gazed ahead through a long reach of future days, strung together like pearls in a rosary, every one like the others, and all smooth and flawless and innocent, and her heart went up in thankfulness. Outside was the fervid summer afternoon. The air was filled with the sounds of the busy harvest of men and birds and bees. There were halloos, metallic clatterings, sweet calls, and long hummings. Louisa sat, prayerfully numbering her days like an uncloistered nun. The first answer is A. Create a mood of domestic happiness and convivial society. Convivial refers to being friendly and social with other people. The only imagery here related to other people is the mentioned halloos, the sound of harvest that include men, and the metallic clatterings, which is probably related to the men harvesting. But notice that these all occur outside, away from Louisa. They're part of the peaceful sounds of the afternoon. They combine with the sweet calls and the long hummings, the sounds of the birds and the bees, so they don't suggest socializing or being friendly with other people as much as they do contribute to a feeling of a peaceful summer afternoon. B. Establish an attitude of separation and loneliness. While this imagery doesn't bring the feeling of conviviality, it also doesn't establish a feeling of loneliness. While being alone isn't necessarily a negative, it can certainly be a positive thing. Loneliness is a negative, and Louisa's future days are described as pearls in a rosary, smooth and flawless and innocent. She sits prayerfully numbering those days like an uncloistered nun. So while she might be contemplating being alone, and while this imagery does call to mind solitude, it doesn't establish a mood of loneliness. C suggests a rejection of worldly things in favor of a purely spiritual realm. There is imagery associated with spirituality here. The days like pearls and a rosary and prayerfully numbering those days and doing it like an uncloistered nun are all religious images. But there's also the fervid summer afternoon, the birds and the bees, and the outdoor sounds of activity. Those are worldly things, and the passage suggests that Louisa is enjoying them rather than rejecting them, so this answer can't be supported. D. Leave an impression of an impending romantic encounter. Not only is there nothing that leaves an impression of a romantic encounter to come, but we have the opposite with a simile like an uncloistered nun. Nuns don't marry or engage in romantic encounters, so this answer is contradicted by imagery in the passage. E. Affirm an atmosphere of reclusive peace and tranquility. We do have a lot of imagery here that indicates peace and tranquility. Serenity and placid narrowness. Future days strung together like pearls in a rosary, all smooth and flawless and innocent. Sweet calls and long hummings prayerfully numbering her days. These all suggest peace and tranquility. The uncloistered nun simile affirms the reclusive part of this answer. Reclusive implies voluntary solitude, as does being a nun. So this answer is very supportable, and it's the best one we have. Question 9. By comparing Louisa to an uncloistered nun in line 75, the narrator invites a further comparison between what and what. Our first choice is A. The sounds outside the house and the peace within it. There hasn't been a comparison between the sounds outside the house and the peace within it. We have a description of the noises outside the house here in lines 70 through 74, but no description of the peace inside the house other than as that peace rests within Louisa herself, which we see implied here in line 66 and 70, when she gazed ahead through a long reach of future days strung together like pearls in a rosary, everyone like the others, and all smooth and flawless and innocent, and her heart went up in thankfulness. Furthermore, the peace that Louisa feels isn't even compared with the noises outside. It's implied that the noises outside contribute to the peace that Louisa feels, but the noises and the peace aren't being compared at all. So this answer is not supportable. B. The different futures open to men and women. 
The only mention of men here is the busy harvest of men in line 72, and that's simply part of the noise going on outside. The reference to an uncloistered nun is in no way comparing the different futures open to men and women. To try to make this answer work, you'd have to say that somehow a man's potential future as a harvest worker is being compared to a woman's potential future as a nun, and there just isn't any way you can support that interpretation from this passage. See Louisa's home and a house of worship. The focus isn't on Louisa's home. It's on Louisa herself and her feelings after she has made this life decision not to get married. As we saw before, there isn't any description of the house even. The descriptions, other than the outdoor noises, revolve around Louisa herself and her thoughts and her feelings. So the reference to an uncloistered nun is not suggesting a comparison between Louisa's home and a house of worship. D, the conditions of Louisa's life and the life in a convent. A convent is the place where nuns live. And nuns, of course, don't marry. They take vows of celibacy, and it's a voluntary thing. Convents are typically places of quiet work, spiritual reflection, etc. So saying that Louisa sits prayerfully numbering her days like an uncloistered nun does call to mind a comparison between the conditions of Louisa's life and a nun's life in a convent. This is a well-supported answer. And the last answer choice, E, individuals and society, is insupportable. There's just nothing about this reference to an uncloistered nun that invites such a comparison. And the best response is D, the conditions of Louisa's life and the life in a convent. Question 10. The excerpt is chiefly concerned with a what? A, hope and its defeat. There is no hope that is defeated in this passage. Both Louisa and Joe get what they really want deep down, which is out of their relationship with each other. B. Dispute and its adjudication. An adjudication is a formal judgment on a disputed matter, and there is no dispute and no formal judgment, so no to this response. C. Plan and its execution. Louisa does have a plan here in this part. She plans to have a discussion with Joe, and she does. So we have a plan and an execution. But the plan for an execution of this discussion isn't what the excerpt is chiefly concerned with. It's just a part of it. However, we'll put a question mark next to this and see if we have anything better before we discount it entirely. D. Problem and its analysis. We don't have any kind of analysis of a problem here. You could say that there seems initially to be a problem when Louisa overhears Lily Dyer, and you might say that Louisa and Joe being engaged when it's not what either of them want deep down is the problem. But any analysis of either of these things goes on solely inside the heads of the characters. We never see any of it, so we can't say that this passage is chiefly concerned with a problem in its analysis. E. Decision and its effect. We do have a decision and its effect. Louisa decides to break off her engagement to Joe, and we get the effect of that. But can we say that the excerpt is chiefly concerned with it, especially compared to our other answer that has a question mark by it? Well, if you look, you see that the opening incident of the passage, the overheard exchange with Lily Dyer, sets Louisa on the path to making the decision. Then Louisa makes it, discusses it with Joe, Afterward, she and Joe have an exchange based on the decision, and then we have the effect that decision has on Louisa for the remainder of the passage. This answer works better than C because the plan and its execution are part of the decision and its effect. E is a more complete answer, and therefore the better of the two, and the best of all the choices that we have. Question 11. Which of the following best describes Joe Daggett's speech? Joe Daggett doesn't have many lines in this passage. The first example of his speech is here, where he says, Well, I never shrank, Louisa. I'm going to be honest enough to say that I think maybe it's better this way. But if you'd wanted to keep on, I'd have stuck to you till my dying day. I hope you know that. Then he says, Well, this ain't the way we thought it was all going to end, is it, Louisa? And then... You let me know if there's ever anything I can do for you. I ain't ever going to forget you, Louisa. 
So the choices we have, A, informal and straightforward, sounds pretty good. Joe's language is certainly informal. I'd have stuck to you, he says, and this ain't the way we thought it was all going to end. I ain't ever going to forget you. This is very informal language. He's also straightforward. I'm going to be honest enough to say I think maybe it's better this way, he tells Louisa. So informal and straightforward is a very easily supported answer. B. Subtle and refined. You can hardly describe using the word ain't as refined, and there's nothing very subtle about the way that he says anything in these few lines that he speaks. He plainly tells Louisa that he thinks it's better that they end their engagement, so subtle and refined are not good descriptions of his language. C. Amorous and impassioned. Amorous means showing sexual desire, and impassioned means showing great emotion. These are not good descriptors of Joe's language either. D. Pedantic and pompous. Pedantic refers to being overly formal, meticulous, or precise, and pompous is being affectedly and irritatingly grand, solemn, or self-important, neither of which are adjectives that apply to Joe's language here. E. Colloquial and unfocused. Colloquial refers to language that is conversational, so this could apply to Joe's speech. However, there's nothing unfocused about what Joe says or the way he says it, so we have to eliminate this answer as well. And the best answer is A, informal and straightforward. Question 12. At the end of the excerpt, Louisa probably believes that Joe Daggett had been what? Notice that this question asks what Louisa believes that Joe had been, not what he is now. Keeping that in mind, let's look at the answers. A, the only man she could have loved. Well, just based on this passage, we're not sure that Louisa did or could have loved Joe at all, let alone whether or not he's the only man she could ever have loved. There's nothing here to support this answer. B, a better man than she had originally thought. We don't have any evidence that at any point Louisa thought that Joe was a better man than she had originally thought. We don't know what kind of man Louisa thought Joe was to begin with, and there's nothing to indicate that her opinion of him has improved or worsened at any point in the passage. C. Unlikely ever to speak to her again. We can assume that she doesn't think this, as Joe got through telling her to let him know if there's ever anything he can do for her in line 42, and there's no reason to think that she had believed this about him at any other point in time either. D. Unwilling to stand by his promises. We can be pretty sure that she doesn't think this at the end of the passage, as he just finished telling her in lines 30 and 32 that he would have stuck with her till his dying day if she'd wanted to keep on with their relationship and marriage. We can assume that she didn't think this about him earlier, because when he says those lines, I'd have stuck with you till my dying day, I hope you know that, her response is, yes, I do know that. E, a threat to her personal freedom. Based on her reflections about the future, after she has broken off the engagement to Joe, we can assume that she had thought of him, or marriage to him, as a threat to her freedom. After all, the morning after they break up, she feels like a queen who, after fearing lest her domain be wrested away from her, sees it firmly insured in her possession. Now that she is no longer going to be married to Joe, she'll be able to sew linen seams and distill roses and dust and polish and fold away in lavender as long as she listed. These feelings of relief and reflection on the freedom she is now looking forward to as an unmarried woman imply that she viewed being married to Joe and, in effect, Joe himself as a threat to that freedom. So the best answer is E. Louisa believes Joe had been a threat to her personal freedom.